Hello, and welcome to the Archaeological Lab Science Podcast. I'm your host, Sophia Siebert, and here today with me is Dr. William Gardner, a postdoctoral researcher at Yale, whose work focuses on iron smelting technologies in ancient Mongolia. So why don't you start by telling me about about your paper, um, Microscale Iron Smelting in Early Iron Age to Mongol Period Steppe Communities of North Central Mongolia and its Implications. Yeah, so, you know, this paper actually was done in collaboration with uh, Dr. Jang Sik Park, uh, who was introduced to us by uh, William Honeychurch. He's someone that he has worked with extensively in the past, and this gentleman has done a lot of work in Mongolia metallurgy. And so really it just actually just happened to be kind of like a fortuitous type uh, of a process that we just happened to come across some metallurgical samples in an archaeological excavation of a uh, Mongol period habitation site. <clears throat> and so this is just uh, kind of the offshoot from that. Uh, it's just kind of the, his work. It's not really something that I would ever have uh, kind of pursued independently. It, metallurgy and metallurgical studies weren't exactly my um, area of expertise. The whole process was kind of unique to us, and it was just really an example of kind of the different kind of collaborative um, kind of projects that can develop uh, within archaeology. And, and just really it was an opportunity for us to learn more about the kind of different um, kind of I guess, labor- laboratory sciences that are employed within the, the discipline of archaeology. Cool. Mm-hmm. So what question did you set out to answer with this paper? Uh, so to be honest, uh, we really uh, weren't the ones that initiated the paper. And it, it's as funny as that is. So, uh, and I say we uh, is in the sense that was, uh, my colleague, uh, Jargalon Burn Talk Talk. So yeah, so Jargal and I, uh, Bill's other uh, postdoc and his other student, he, you know, he and I were conducting a, a large excavation project in Mongolia <clears throat> over the past couple summers. And we ended up discovering a, a large Mongol period um, habitation site. And so this, in the particular instance in 2018, the information that was used for this article was a, a large pit house. And it was a really dynamic uh, kind of structure. That it, so it's a semi-subterranean uh, structure dug into Los, and then with subsequent uh, then posts that would have ringed the, the the house area itself, the domicile itself, and then around those posts they built up a superstructure. In this particular instance, so it seems that they put a lot more um, energy into the structure. It had nice wood floors. There was a large hearth feature that was kind of in the one corner, and a lot of different actual ritual activities that. Uh, that we noted a lot of different ritual materials were were encountered and so where i'm going with this is that you know really we had this really dynamic um data set and it was just kind of a, a fortuitous introduction uh from to, with mr park and our team and he really only was working with maybe a handful of samples i think he had something like you know overall it's not mentioned in the in the article but i think you know it was analyzing about 20 some odd um uh, pieces of of metal, uh, slag, fragments, things of that nature, and so you know he was really just kind of setting out with the the intent of understanding what type of processes were they using in terms of their metal production, and so you know for us we were kind of really ultimately blind to to what he would be able to produce. Um, but what what's cool when it's all said and done is, yeah, we didn't come into it with any specific questions. You know, he had this one idea of just wanting to know how things were made, but, you know, out of it, growing out of this work, we've actually really kind of developed uh, a new understanding of dy- dy- dynamic um, production capabilities of simple um, mobile households. And so moving forward, you know, we may not have had questions when we went into it, but coming out of it, we had a lot of questions. And, and one of them, which is, is, you know, how how actually, you know, dynamic was this uh, household scale production? Uh, and, you know, to, to, to know what extent was it practiced within each household in that region? And, you know, so there's a lot of different kind of levels of, you know, questions now that we, you know, kind of been introduced to this general line of inquiry that we really hope to like kind of spread our wings out, if you will, and explore more. I want to ask in a minute about um, the the new questions you have. Mm-hmm. But first, um, I was wondering when you mentioned the wood floors, mm-hmm. there aren't many trees on the steps, are there? Where do you, where, what kind of, I mean, what kind of wood is the wood floors? Where does it come from? And 
What do they use for the fuel and the smelting? Well, uh, that's the one thing. Um, so we actually work in the far north Mongolia, and I think that's one thing that just kind of colloquial knowledge of Mongolia automatically just kind of assumes that you have the vast either, you know, deserts of the Gobi or the kind of the sweeping grasslands. But we are actually right on the verge of uh, the um, – taiga forests, the, the saboreal forests of, of Siberia. And so we're in a forest, forest step uh, transitional zone. And so there's actually quite a lot of, of, of trees and, and different vegetation in that nature. So actually, uh, the, the fuels themselves were not a limiting point uh, for these individuals. So what about the iron? Where, where was the iron mined? Well, this was an interesting um, kind of find. And original hypothesis was was that these individuals were essentially collecting um, a scrap material, uh, any sort of, of damaged or, or, or fractured or, or broken cast iron pieces that have, would have you know, maybe potentially been traded into Mongolia from China, then subsequently kind of came to the end of their use life as an actual, say, like a pot. We'll just use a pot. A pot gets traded uh, and makes its way. And then you know, over the years, it, the pot develops a crack or something of that nature, and it just becomes a, a waste item. Well, in that particular instance, what we're finding is, is these types of things were actually being recycled and reused uh, quite extensively. And so even something like, you know, say that pot got broken up and fractured into like several little pieces, someone though could take maybe a, a, like a little, say like a four inch by five inch piece of this, this cast iron pot and then, you know, melt it down and, and then ultimately create something else out of it. In this particular instance, you know, small rubbish, eh, what would have been considered rubbish could be reused in multiple different ways, making fish hooks or making needles, making, you know, lots of different utilitarian items. And so that was, was something that was really interesting in that sense that it, it appeared to begin with. And that when we wrote this article, you know, it really appeared that, you know, these were just a process of recycling. And we still believe that to be taking place. However, just in this past field season uh the 2000 well now it's been the 2019 or 18 uh field season uh we actually conducting ethnographic studies come across an individual who pointed out a an actual local um iron source where uh individuals have been known to go and quarry different just kind of just you know the quarry the native uh, rock there and been able to to kind of fracture that down and get iron ore out of that for uh smelting purposes so it's it's something that's you know even since the time of writing this paper we now are kind of aware of local outcrops and, and local raw material that can be used um my next question was about bloomery iron smelting which you mentioned several times in the paper i was wondering what is what is bloomery smelting how does that differ from from other methods, what's the advantage of, of or disadvantages of using one method over another? Why this particular method that I'd never heard of? Well, so to be honest, I I, I will say that I'm not an expert in this, <clears throat> and so my understanding of the processes just essentially come from you know uh, a quick review of Wikipedia. <laughs> but in in this particular case, what happens is is you had a a form of production called cast. Uh, cast production, cast iron production, that was really prevalent in China. And so for the longest time, it was just assumed that any sort of um, iron and, and, and metal materials would have come from the South. And with that being said, if there was going to be any sort of transfer of, of information and transfer of technology, the most likely source would have been coming from the South, from China. And, and so the idea was that if there was local metal production, it would have followed the same um, technology uh, pattern as that in being product or you know pr practiced in China. So a cast iron in this particular sense, what happens is, and, and again, forgive me for not um, you know have a better understanding, but it, it, what it boils down to is essentially, A, you're, you're melting the, the, the iron ore completely to get a molten state. Uh, and then subsequently pouring that into a mold to create an item. And then B, the amount of carbon in that iron is different than what happened, what you get in a bloomery uh, production. And so that actually changes the strength, the properties of the metal. Now, in a bloomery production, you're not actually creating an, a molten iron. Uh, you're actually introducing uh, carbon via charcoal in order to create a chemical uh, reaction inside of the furnace and ultimately have the the iron that's in the ore that you're you're heating up or 
in this particular case, say a waster piece of of metal that was taken from a you know like a cast iron, you're introducing it in with uh, carbon from charcoal, and you're heating it to a point where you're not actually melting it completely, uh, but you're creating a chemical reaction between the carbon and the iron oxide in order to form. Uh, a slightly different, uh, essentially, you're still getting iron, but with a slightly different chemical uh, composition than what would have been created in a cast iron um, uh, environment. And so because you're not actually fully melting the uh, iron, you're actually, you, you can get away with lower temperatures inside of your furnace. So what often, often happens is, is you'll have uh, kind of a largely, um, kind of a small you can use a smaller central a central furnace area and then you're essentially in injecting oxygen into the environment either through a bellows system or some other form of 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 kind of chamber like that creates a draft in order to kind of you know inject oxygen into the environment uh, just to help create you know to keep the temperatures high uh but again, you're, you're not working with a completely molten material. That kind of leads me to my next question. I was also wondering about the challenges of, of iron smelting in a mobile community. I mean, so did they have furnaces at every location they went to? Did they have some kind of portable furnace that they brought with them, something else? Well, this is what's interesting. And we didn't have this information available to us at the time of the first article. But in a subsequent excavation, we actually found a uh, a furnace feature, and it's really interesting. What they had actually just done it was is create a little local furnace uh, just by simply excavating into the loess deposits. And <clears throat> so what what had happened was is on the edge of a like a river bank, you have a you know have a river cut bank, and you know you got a, a fair amount of loess deposits. They excavated a small little chamber that would be their area for reduction like your central furnace and then they very carefully just dug a tunnel that exited out the back of the furnace and then actually opened up on the edge of the river cut bank so you imagine imagine like you got a little river cut bank a few feet in from the river cut bank you have this little furnace pit pit that they've dug and then they've dug a little tube that goes from the, the central chamber out and then essentially opens up to you know to the the world if you will on the river cut bank and then ultimately what that allows to do is to take the, allow them to take advantage of just natural um uh wind flow the winds are kind of forcing air through this little tunnel that they've created kind of acting like a bellow into the the little the furnace area and then right next to the 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 furnace area they had a second hearth where they were actually that's where they were uh making their charcoal so burning uh different probably different pine or uh, this they have larch and and pine are available there and so burning different woods creating a charcoal and then introducing that charcoal into the furnace area with their iron ore and then you know to kind of create the bloomery process right there have you ever tried to replicate their methods yourself or do you just have you just looked at what they did no, this I mean, is yeah. This is something that we've uh, attempted to experiment with ourselves. Uh, you know, to be honest, one of the as silly as this is, you know, one of the biggest things is within the valley itself. There's kind of just a reservation about any sort of open fires, uh, campfires, things of that nature are a little bit frowned on. And so, to be good neighbors, we really don't have open fires within the valley. And to be honest, it's something that we haven't um, experimented. I mean. Th the opportunity does exist. It would be something that could be easily recreated. It's it, it all said and done. It's a very um, simple process. What they've created, uh, and we have experimented with a similar style of production when it com comes to ceramics, and we we had success in replicating uh, you know their production methods. But as far as the, the metal objects themselves, we haven't tried no. Um, so that brings me to my next question, which is the metal objects. What were they? Uh, in the paper, you mentioned um, bushings for cart axles. I assume that wasn't the only thing they made with metal. What else did they make? Well, the bushings, the bushings for the car ax cart axles were a little bit different than um, our actual findings. So that was just an example uh, that uh, the gentleman – Jang used Jengsik Park used as kind of an example of actually there were other methods of production. That was one of the first kind of times in Mongolia where 
bloomery production had been noted. So we actually never found anything of that particular nature in our project area. Uh, for us, they were really just focused on utilitarian items. Again, you know, reducing kind of the, the, the limited amounts of, of cast iron or, uh, or fragments they had down to small objects that were <clears throat> of importance to them. Uh, fish hooks actually end up being one of the bigger, more important items. There's large rivers in our area. And so we're now coming to understand that, you know, kind of fishing and uh, fish agriculture played a, an important part uh, in kind of their helping, you know, for them kind of just balance out their diet. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. So for my last question, I, I told you I'd come back to that. Um, you, you mentioned earlier, you had questions at the end that you didn't have at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so now I'll ask you um, what, what's the next question you want to answer with your research? Well, I mean, so, when, when you can go places again. Yeah. Well, you know, now really what we're kind of curious is, is just how widespread this phenomenon was. And, you know, because of the fact that we're seeing local scale production and local household production, is this something that was kind of present all across the greater Mongolian steppe? And, you know, the idea being is that lots of times in pastoralists, uh, archaeology, anthropology, in the anthropology and archaeology of mobile pastoralists in Mongolia especially, there's a lot of dependency theories. People that kind of always want to say that, you know, anything and everything that Mongolia was able to accomplish was because of the fact that it relied so heavily on more advanced neighbors uh, like, like China. Uh, and what we really want to advance is that, no, these people were, you know, independent and, you know, very kind of resilient and so this is an important kind of step in that direction to show that even at small scales, these individuals were able to produce um, important utilitarian items that would have made them independent and self-sufficient. And we really just want to continue to build that record and just kind of add into these different lines of evidence that show kind of the dynamic nature of the mobile pastoralist lifeway and that it's not something that's you know reliant on others but is an inviolable uh, and distinct lifeway that's you know fully self-sufficient thank you everyone for listening once again that was dr william gardner i'm sophia siebert and this has been the archaeological lab science podcast